Well, I think most of you probably are familiar with what an oxymoron is. I just, um, is there like a little bit of light, or is this what I got? So, uh, yeah, mostly it would be right here. So. so an oxymoron, here's the definition anyways, is a combination of contradictory or incongruous words. And I think most of you maybe know that. Here's some examples like jumbo shrimp's probably the most famous one, right? We have jumbo and then shrimp, which is, seems contradictory, all right? Awfully good. This is actually one I use in my vocabulary. Boy, that was really awfully good, wasn't it? I like this one. He was clearly confused. Uh, actually, never mind. Act natural. I'm getting it mixed up. So, original copy. And I like this one. Random orders. So these are examples of oxymorons. You have a couple of words that are contradictory or incongruous. That means they just don't harmonize. Right? That's your, that's your big extra word learning for this evening. Now, the word paradox is something that we're going to look at tonight. And paradox, this is just a, general, um, just a general definition. It's a statement, instead of words, it's a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense, and yet is perhaps true. That's what we would call a paradox. Like this, for example. This is a line from the Shakespeare play Hamlet, book Hamlet. I must be cruel to be kind. So if you look at that and you think, wait a sec, that doesn't quite make sense, right? And I didn't look up the meaning behind that because uh, I, you know, I didn't have time to do that. And actually, for me, if you're my age, though, you're probably familiar. There's a song in the early 80s, Cruel to be Kind, right? So, so now that I said that, if you're my age, that song has just popped into your head and you're bouncing your head like that. But I must be, I like this one. Well, this next one is attributed to a, a guy named Yogi Berra. He was a, a, a baseball pitcher. And uh, or not a pitcher, but a player and a manager for the New York Yankees, was always being quoted for stuff. He said this, nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. And that's one where you kind of look at it and you think, well, first it doesn't sound right, but then that really is not only funny, but actually true, right? Places get so crowded, nobody goes there anymore. <clears throat> How about this one? Deep down, he's really shallow. So those are examples of paradoxes. And tonight we want to talk about paradoxes. Now, a paradox is a statement that is meant to really attract your attention. It kind of puts it in front of you and hopefully attracts your t attention. Hopefully, it even arouses your curiosity. Hmm, I wonder what that means. I wonder what he's talking about. I wonder what that's saying. And they might even be puzzling at times. Now, and par paradoxes are actually marvelous instructors. In fact, the Bible uses paradoxical statements to teach. And I didn't really know that, you know a little more than a couple of years ago. I didn't even know what a paradox was, to be, be perfectly honest. But the, the Bible uses paradoxical statements to teach truth, and sometimes deep truths, and we're going to learn some of that tonight. So. In fact, in, an example, Paul and his ministry. He's talking about his ministry. He says, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live. Seems kind of strange, doesn't it? As chastened yet not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor and yet making many rich, as having nothing and possessing all things, these seem like they're all contradictory statements, don't they? But there's a truth behind each one of them. I've got to imagine when the believers at Corinth, because these were letters and they were sent to the, this church at Corinth and were read there, I thought, I must imagine some of the people must be going, What? What? As my grandson would say. How can we die and live at the same time? How can we sorrow and yet always rejoice? If I'm poor, how can I make others rich? And if I have nothing, how can I claim to possess everything? And so paradoxes are meant to attract our attention, challenge our faith, and provoke us into deeper thinking. So we did a little series on, with the young people. And normally I'm with the young people on Wednesday nights. So, but they're in the other room. Um, so we did a little series about, oh, probably about a year and a half ago on, on, parad on paradoxes. And I found it actually very interesting. And... Um, I want to give credit where credit's due to. It's based upon a book. I didn't bring the book up here, but you know, an author that I really enjoy, he, he passed on and went to be with the Lord, was Warren Wiersbe, though. And Kurt brought this, this book up right here, Truth On Said, these paradoxical statements. I read a couple of them. I thought, yeah, let's do those. Those are really interesting. And so the paradox, that, the one I'm going to present tonight, the credit really goes to him. I just kind of take the general material, massage it a little bit, and kind of make it personal. But, but uh, it's Warren Wiersbe actually put this book together. So, um, and you've probably heard him mention over the pulpit many times. He's got many, many books and commentaries and things like that. I, I, I particularly enjoy um, his, 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 the way he writes. He has a way of putting things. So. 
This is just a little extra nugget. Did you know the, this is from the Merriam-Webster website? The ancient Greeks were well aware that a paradox can take us outside our usual way of thinking. They, do I have to like touch this on the thing or just it's sorry? Uh, I'll take that call. So. All right, this will be. They combine the prefix para, which means beyond or outside of, with the verb, I don't really don't know what that is, to think. And so we got this uh, word called paradoxos, an ad adjective meaning contrary to expectation. So you look at something, and the real truth is it's like, well, that's kind of contrary to what I was expecting. And notice it really gets you to think outside, not really the box, but just to get, be thinking a little bit further, a little bit deeper. Um, now, I have actually learned there's actually many types of paradoxes, and I wish I had time to go over some. I mean, there's, you know, we're going to look at biblical paradoxes, but there, if you want to Google them, don't do it right now. All right? But Google famous paradoxes, and they're actually kind of interesting. And I, it takes me a while to figure them out because my brain just doesn't function that well, but I did some with the young people, but we don't have time tonight. So, so I want to go back to our definition one more time. A statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense, and yet is perhaps true. So we're talking about a biblical, biblical paradox, so let's scratch the word perhaps, because the biblical paradox is an absolute truth, and we know that to be true. Okay. So why don't we begin and open up our Bibles. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. This is one of those chapters where you have a lot of red letters in your Bible. And Jesus does, is doing a lot of talking, a lot of teaching, sharing. He's talking to crowds. And uh, I'm going to read verses 20 through 30. And then we'll kind of uh, look at what the, what, what's, what's going on behind that. So then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable, excuse me, tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until the day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. So he's pronouncing some woes here, and we'll talk about that in a second. Then he switches. He has a little conversation with his father. At the time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, further, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son will, wills to reveal him. Verse 20 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We sang a song about rest tonight. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 30, we see Jesus Christ is talking about three different kinds of people. First we have, he's pronouncing judgment on the, the faithless. And I'm not going to go back and read that, but basically he had been walking around the countryside, various cities, doing miracles, all kinds of stuff. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. People did not get saved, they rejected him. And he's pronouncing judgment on them. In fact, he's saying, you know what, it's going to be worse for you than it was for these other past judge um, cities and countries because you have more truth. And there, there is really a level of accountability with God. You know, for the unsaved, the more truth that he gives them, the, the, the greater the judgment. So I don't know exactly know what that means, but I do see that principle in the scriptures. And so he's saying it's going to be worse for you than it was for them because they saw, they saw all these miracles. So they should have saw those miracles, said there's something about this guy, came to the realization that he is God, and become saved, what they did. All right, so that's basically the gist of the first four verses. Now, during Jesus' brief ministry on planet Earth, the people that study things a little more than I do um, came to the conclusion his public ministry is about three and a half years. I've thought about that. Three and a half years, that's not very long. Three and a half years and it changed 
the world. Three and a half years and it rocked the world. And the world has never been the same. Thousands of years later, we're still talking about it. So talk about an impact that his public ministry had. So he had a public ministry for about three and a half years. What did he do? He went out and he went out across the countryside and he, he demonstrated his love for the people. He helped people. He fed hungry people. He, he, um, he, he, he delivered people from demons. He healed the afflicted. He um, did all kinds of miracles. And we've read about those in the Gospels, if you read the Gospels at all. In fact, let's uh, skip ahead to Matthew chapter 12, a couple pages to your right. We'll get a brief look at one of these Gospels, or miracles, excuse me. Matthew 12, verse 22 says, Then then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. What did Jesus do? He healed him. So that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Absolute miracle. Notice, and all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? They're referring, Could this be the Messiah? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, and the Pharisees were the religious rulers of the day, what did they say? This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. So the, some of the people are amazed and saying, could this be the Messiah, the promised Messiah that we've been waiting for? And yet the religious people rejected and said, you know what, he's doing these miracles with the power, through the power of Satan. And here's what we're after. What were the responses of those who saw Jesus perform this miracle? Well, some were amazed, right? Some were marveled. They were blown away. And yet some said, you know what? No, he did these by the power of the devil. So some responded positively, some responded negatively. And going back to Matthew chapter 11 in our first portion of Scripture, we saw the Lord was indicting those who who would not put their faith in Jesus Christ. They heard his messages. They saw his miracles. They heard his teaching, and yet they would not believe him, and they would not believe he gets saved. Really sad. In fact, John made the commentary, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. So why did Jesus do miracles then? To show off? right? Like, watch this, right? Or to go on Capernaum's Got Talent, maybe? No, as Pastor Roxer says, let's let the Bible answer itself, or something like that. So we're going to get back here, but let's go to John chapter 20. We'll let the Bible answer itself. I think about teaching adults here, also quiet. The young people are a little bit louder. John chapter 20, in verse 30 and 31. Here we really have the purpose statement for the book of John. It says, and truly Jesus did many other signs. All right, signs refers to miracles. It's a slightly different word, but it means the same thing. Jesus is doing these miracles. Why? In the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So not only are there miracles written in this book, there are ones that didn't even get written in this book. But these are written that you what? You may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John explained the purpose of writing this gospel. Now people might read this, people might under, know about these miracles and understand that this is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, and believe on him so that they could get saved. John selected seven miracles, I don't really know by, and, and, and for those who like to count things, someone counted all the miracles, I believe there was like 35 of them, 30, 35 different ones in the gospels. And unfortunately, there were people back in Jesus' day that had all this information and said, you know what, I, don't want, I choose to believe. I choose to reject Jesus Christ. And that's no different today. Right? I mean, we may not be witnessing miracles quite like that, but we have them written down. We have the scriptures and all kinds of other stuff. In fact, in fact there's, a lot, there's a lot of light in this world given computers and programs and books and devotions and Bibles and studies and things like that. There's a lot of light going on. And yet people are still choosing to re- reject Jesus Christ. And it's really sad. Right? He came to his own, his own creation and his own people, the Jews rejected. And so um, our commission though is to preach the gospel, right? I mean, we do a lot of teaching through our various ministries, but the bottom line is preaching the gospel, a message to a lost world, because people need to get saved. And that's what God wants us to do. In fact, you think about, look at the towns that Jesus went to. He went to Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, is what we see here. 
nobody got saved. I mean, he was going to places and people weren't believing him. Why he went there, I don't know. Maybe so he could write this stuff down. But there's people that do respond and people that don't respond. Those cities did not respond very well. And so in this passage, Jesus is pronouncing judgment on the faithless. Right? Now he's dealing with three kinds of people. Next, we have Jesus and the whoops, we are right now. Jesus and the helpless. Whoops. And I'm not going to read that again either. But he's just he's having a conversation with his father, and what he really says is thank you for saving the babes. He calls them. Right? He's talking about the helpless. Thank you, Lord, for saving helpless people, because that's really what it takes for somebody to get saved. They have to see themselves as helpless, unable to gain or merit their own salvation. You've heard it many times over this pulpit. Um, you know, you've got to believe, understand that you're a helpless, hopeless, hellbound sinner or something like that. But helpless is the key, right? And there are people that realize, I can't get to heaven by myself. And so right here, Jesus thanks his gracious Father for being willing to love those lost sinners. Man, the religious leaders today, you know, they were proud of their religious traditions. They had their wonderful temple. You know, they walked around and spoke high and mighty things. They met weekly in the synagogues. But they didn't see themselves as sinners in need of a Savior. And they get condemned over and over and over, the religious people of the day. If they had, in fact, that Jesus Christ refers to them in the scripture as the wise and prudent. Prudent really carries the idea of looking ahead to the future, and yet they weren't because they, they, they rejected their Messiah. Their Messiah came to set up their kingdom. and They rejected their own Messiah. They eventually had him killed on the cross. If they had hum humbled themselves and saw themselves as helpless, God would have saved them. And that's really what it takes for somebody to see, I am incapable of, of helping myself. Now, about a year and a half ago, the young people did a play, right? Called Tumbleweed Opera. And this is the gospel portion of it. And the reason I put this picture up is because the, these were the outlaws, all right? We had bootleggers and bank robbers and things like that. And they sang a song called what? We Ain't That Bad. And so the point, as they were getting to hear the gospel, they're like, wait, wait a sec, we're not that bad. Well, the point is, yes, they were. But so are we all. We're all helpless. We're all incapable of gaining or working our way to heaven. And in fact, I gotta admit, when I first started hearing the gospel, I remember I didn't say we ain't I ain't that bad. But I remember thinking that, well, I ain't that bad. I didn't sing a song or nothing. No, salvation is God helping the helpless. In fact, apart from God, no one can get to heaven. Jesus paid the price, greatest sacrifice. Heaven paid the price with Calvary's. Third group of people. Jesus and the restless. Now, you're pro now if you're a student, you're thinking, hey, I thought we were going to learn about a paradox. I haven't heard anything about that yet. So we're getting there. And did I start about 6.50? What did you say? I'm just trying to keep track of time. Now, let's go back and read our portion of Scripture, Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to look at Verses 20 through 30. This is the portion of scripture we really want to key in. And I really had a wonderful time learning more about this. I, you know, I knew about this and had you know, quoted it a few times. And I understood what it basically was about. But it's kind of fun. It was fun to dig into this a little bit more. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 30. Jesus said, remember, he pronounced judgment. Thank God for saving the helpless. Now he says, we got an invitation. He says, come to me. Remember, there's all kinds of people here. All who are all who all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so we come to our paradox. This is our paradox. We are yoked to be free, and that's where it should be right on the top of your handout. We are yoked to be free. Now, Jesus was a carpenter, right? I imagine, you know, the, the, the um, yokes would have been made out of wood, so he might have been familiar, might have worked on some, might have fixed some, I'm not really sure. But I do know that uh, in Jesus' day, certainly they all would have been under, very, uh, they would have known what it, and very, been very familiar with what a yoke was. In fact, what is a yoke? Here's, I like to define things. 
A yoke is a wooden bar frame by which two draft animals, as oxen, are joined at the heads or necks for working together. Right? So we have a picture of the, the yoke right there. And I'm sure, whoops, let me make sure I write on the right pen. I couldn't be the first one to write on there with the real pen, could I? So. <clears throat> now, this is not probably not a real familiar scene here in Duluth, Minnesota. I remember going to El Salvador in the small cities. Oh, that's very common there. You know, they're still using oxen. So that's what a yoke is there. Now, two oxen, why two oxen? Why not just one? Well, two oxen together under yoke could pull a greater weight with less effort and work longer than a single animal because the weight of the burden is being shared by two people. I found that kind of interesting. Keep that in mind for later on. So that's what a yoke is, but what is another definition of yoke? The word yoke, if you punch in definition of yoke in Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, is servitude or bondage. So I thought, well, I don't exactly know. I kind of know what one means, but I don't know what the other one means. What's servitude? A condition in which one lacks liberty, one lacks freedom, especially determines one course of action or way of life. That's what servitude is. And bondage is the state of being bound, subjugation to a controlling person or force. We put this all together, and really what it means is you are not free. There is no freedom. Throughout the Bible, a yoke is a symbol of bondage. And while removing though or breaking a yoke signifies freedom. And we're going to see that the yoke that Jesus wants to give us gives us freedom, not bondage. It helps us to grow in the Christian life. So how can being yoked make us free? Wearing the yoke that Christ gives you enables you to find rest and freedom in your heart. And I don't know if Tom knew what I was teaching on or what, but he shows that song, Rest, which, which actually fits in very well. Wearing the yoke Christ gives you enables you to find rest and freedom in your heart. Sorry if you're writing. I should have made that a fill-in-the-blank thing, because that's a lot of I hate writing all that stuff. Especially when the speaker moves on to the next thing right away. It always bugs me. So. Maybe it doesn't bug me. So, we are yoked that we might be free. That is our paradox. Here's a quote. That was a quote in Wearsby's book. The British theologian P.T. Forsyth wrote, according to Wearsby, the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. It's like, hmm, what does that mean? Let's go back a couple of years after the Bulldogs won their second consecutive NCAA men's hockey championship. You know, one thing I heard over and over from both players and commentators, especially commentators that were neutral, was how well coached the Bulldogs were. You know, I'm not enough of a hockey mind to say so, but they must be, right? I mean, obviously you need some talented players. They've got to be able to skate. They've got to be able to shoot the puck, things like that. They have to execute, right? They've got to play defense, offense, penalty kills, power plays, things like that. But how does a student achieve greatness in a sport, any sport? By putting himself or herself under the tutelage of a gifted instructor, in this case a coach. Submission really is the way to success. And that's the case here. And that's why we have to have teams to practice. It does, we have to practice over and over. Now, so how does a student achieve greatness in a sport, any sport? Again, by putting themselves under the tutelage or direction of a gifted instructor. And you need to be coachable, you need to be teachable, you need to be able to take correction, and you need to be able to take discipline. In fact, how do students, how do students become first-rate musicians, right? How do you become a musical virtuoso? Play YouTube videos? I mean, they could help, I guess. No, by putting themselves under the guidance and discipline of a gifted instructor, and really exchanging your freedom, because at that time it's like, no, you can't just do what you want, you need to do what the instructor is telling you. Why? So you can be disciplined and you can grow in whatever venue you're trying to do. And then one day, you will finally have the freedom to perform skillfully. Why? Because you found the right master. In fact, how do you become a Jedi Knight? Right? You place yourself under a Jedi Master. You submit yourself and be under the tutelage of a Jedi Master. And of course, you know this is you know, not real, but same principle, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> when 
one time I did that for my grandson. I can talk a little bit like him. He's like, well, you should go on America's Got Talent. But no. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. So. Actually, you can apply this to anything. You know, any sport, you know, theater, school, job, academics, or whatever the case may be. Right. So what's the point? I have a point. The point is, the way to freedom is obedience to the right master. And for us Christians, that master is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right? The way to get freedom is obedience to the right master. And for us, that master is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know, Moses gave the people of Israel a lesson, object lesson, about yokes that teaches us an important spiritual principle, right? He says, you should not plow with an ox and a donkey together. And the reason, reason's obvious. Well, they're radically different, right? It would be obviously difficult for them to work together. In fact, the Apostle Paul used the same principle to instruct the Corinthians to be separated from false teachers. And you could actually make this application in other places. But be not unequally yoked. See, in the Jewish law, the donkey was unclean, but the oxen was a clean animal. Donkey's impulsive, independent, while the ox is slow and deliberate. They just would not work very well together. So. And thank somebody on, on internet that was able to take the time to cut and paste that because it made it much easier to give you a picture. So. Now we mentioned Jesus and the restless. We're talking about a peace. We're talk, talking about trying to find a peace or rest. Restless can be defined as lacking or denying rest, continually moving. Right? You ever see a restless person? They're always kind of, I'm kind of moving all up here. I was talking moving on. In fact, I have a restless leg. I don't know why. I never think of all, but I'm sitting there, my leg goes up and down. So lacking or denying rest, but continually moving is one use, one definition for restless. You know, and frankly, we live in kind of a restless world. You know, pre-COVID, we could travel quickly and across the world and zip, zip all over, right? We can communicate faster. We can spread things around. I mean, it's a zip, 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 zip world. Sometimes it's too fast. It gets overwhelming, right? Sometimes we pay a price for our modern society. In fact, add that on there. Characterized by manifesting unrest, especially of mind. And a practical application of that would be being anxious. You, know, you could pick a bunch of them. Being anxious or anxiety, whatever you want to call it. You know, and this can show itself in a lot of areas. It can be like academics. You know, when you're in school, there can be a lot of pressure. There's deadlines. Could be extracurricular activities, might be pressure there, it takes time, coaches around. Could be your job, could be in relationships, you know, you can experience anxiousness. I know for me, one of the things I worry about all the time is just safety for my family. You know, especially I got little grandkids and I'm always thinking about them. The world's getting kind of scary. I was thinking of even the anxiousness or the anxiety of social media, right? You text somebody, you haven't heard anything for like 30 seconds, they're like, what's wrong? They must hate me. I must have made them mad. Or the whole Facebook, and I realize, I can talk to you because Facebook's for older people. Just ask the young people. And then I am. But the whole Facebook friending thing, too, that gets kind of tricky, doesn't it? Someone wants to be your friend. Like, I don't really want to be their friend. But you have to because, yeah. And all of a sudden, then you don't want to be someone's friend, but you can't really unfriend us. So you got all this stress going on with social media. Right? And it probably goes beyond that with all the other things, but those are both the only two things that I know to do. So. But anxiety, you know, it's common for all people of all ages. In fact, I experience this to some degree whenever I have to teach. You know, I have a job, I have you know, a life and things like that. I enjoy it, but it's work. I gotta admit, sometimes, like, when I get done with the message, you can almost go, ah. you know, not like I'm glad it's over, but I'm glad it's over, because it kind of takes that stress off. It's kind of like when you get done with a big paper, right, or a big assignment, like, ah, boy, that feels really good. So, in fact, I like this cartoon, and I'll read it for you. It says, Kelvin and Hobbes, right? Hobbes is a little tiger. Do you have an idea for your story yet? No, I'm waiting for inspiration. I don't know if you can see that. You can't just turn on creativity like a faucet. You have to be in the right mood. Well, what mood is that? He's at last minute panic. <laughs> in fact, I was waiting to get up here. I was thinking, you know, whenever we take these teach assignments, it's like, want to do something this summer? It's like everybody tries, everybody tries to get as far away later in the summer as they can. That's why you've seen most of your guest speakers here the last two weeks. And you think, I got all summer. Pretty soon, well, I got a couple months. I got another one. Pretty soon it's two weeks, one week. Pretty soon you, and you get there, and all of a sudden it's not last minute panic, but it gets there, you know, also. 
That's Kelvin. You know, in fact, I've even had dreams of having teaching assignments and not being ready. Last one I had, and I still do remember that. I had a teaching assignment for the young people. I get there, and I don't have my message ready. Fortunately, only two kids showed up. Pastor was there, and he talked the whole time anyways. <laughs> but Jared, dreams like that? Yeah. In fact, I almost had last minute panic. I was getting ready to come down here, and I told my wife, I realized, ah, my notes, I left them at work. And also, fortunately, I had an extra set we could actually, or we could print out a file. But, but and frankly, and seriously, though, in the world that we live in and all the stressors that can be out there, it's easy to end up like this. In fact, just observing the world, I got to quit watching the news. I've always been kind of a news hound. But it can cause anxiety, man. I mean, our cities are burning in our country. You know? And there's all kinds of stuff going on. So, so well, okay. What are we going to do about this? Thankfully, we have a God who loves us, he cares for us, and he wants to help us. We always need to keep that in mind. How do we quiet a restless heart? Again, let's look at verse 28 here of chapter 11. He says, Come to me, all you who are labor, all you who labor in a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Again, so he's pronounced judgment. He's thanked the Father for helping to help us. Now we see an invitation. Come. All right? Jesus says, Come. And to come, that means to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right? This is a salvation invitation. He's not saying, Come on down. He's just saying, come. Believe on me. Trust in me and be saved. You know, it's interesting. We can't see, we can't go to the founders of the so-called other great religions either, right? Because they're all dead. But we have a Savior that's alive. He's alive. He was resurrected. God resurrected Jesus Christ. He's alive, waiting for the unsaved to come to him. And Jesus is alive. He's able to help us no matter how desperate the situation may be. Right? Because he lives. And we'll sing that if we have enough time. Right? He lived and died to buy my, buy my part in an empty grave is there to prove my Savior left. So it doesn't matter if you are someone in the hospital. It doesn't matter if you were someone in the jail. It doesn't matter if you've got a messed up life. The child on the playground. You can come to Jesus right where you are. Right where they are. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Peter wrote down Acts. So come means to come to Christ to trust him as Savior and Lord. Now, there's an implication here, too, that the word come means that some people may not be going in the right direction. In fact, I think I spend a lot of time around my grandkids, and I have like a, a two and a three and a four and then an older one. I don't know how many times I'm like, oh, you need to come this way. Why? Because they're going in the wrong direction. And so there might be an implication. They might be just believing in the wrong stuff. They might be heading down the wrong. Either way, they're not looking to Christ, and he's saying, come. Right? I'm inviting you to come. In fact, this made me think of the song, you know, we sang at the, uh, the, the Tumbleweed Opera also, and actually uh, uh, me and my family sang this at my daughter's wedding. Right? I come broken to be mended. Didn't matter if you're broken, right? I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned. I, by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcome with open arms, Praise God, just as I am. Come as you are to Jesus Christ and receive him just as you are. Just leave all your sinful baggage at the cross, because that's all been taken care of at the cross, where Jesus bore our sin. In fact, if you're carrying a heavy burden and you're laboring, which this is talking about, you want to get rid of that because the work has already been done. Your, our works will never save us, right? Titus says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his, Jesus Christ's mercy, he saved us. For the mercy of God. For God so loved the world, no matter what shape the individual is in, that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for all those bad things that we do. And now what's our part? If we just believe in him, we shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Come to Jesus means to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so verse 28 is an invitation to salvation. But look a little further. Look at verse 29. It says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So we see the word take. Our Lord doesn't force his yoke upon us. He wants us to accept it willingly, 
and wear it joyfully. That's why I chose that song to be this my joy today. You know, a lot of times I, you sing songs and it's like, well, that's a good song. The truth of that really came to light as I was studying for this, though. Jesus Christ wants us to take his yoke joyfully. Now, why? Because this is really what will get us into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's a little biblical distinction. When we come to Jesus by faith, we are given peace with God. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we come to Jesus Christ, we get, end up with the peace of, with God, right? Before one's saved, even if they don't know it, they're at enmity against God. Right? So then there's peace with God. But then there's the peace of God, this rest. Right? Be anxious for nothing, and we were talking about anxiousness, right? All those stressful issues, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Right? Everything by prayer, general prayer, and, and uh, supplication, we can be you know, very specific about our prayers. We can be thankful. Let our requests be made known to God. And the result is what? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. I can't tell you. I, I'm an administrator. I'm a boss, and I've had to deal with... You know, all that's been going on, I'm not going to get into it, whatever, for the last four months. I can't tell how many times I went to God and said, I don't know what to do. In this verse right here, I said, I need help. You know? So this has been a great promise that I've relied on. And not, it's not the first time in my life, but it's a good go-to. Peace with God means that our sins are forgiven, and we have a right standing before God, and we are members of God's family. That is never to change, right? The peace of God, though, is the quiet confidence we have that God is in control, and we have nothing to fear. If we can get there, and we can have that rest. Peace with God means we're saved. And the peace of God means we are saved. Now, to take a yoke, because that's what we're talking about in Jesus' day, it meant to become a disciple. In fact, Wiersbe said the Jewish boys, when they attached themselves to a rabbi, were basically taking the yoke of the rabbi. And so what does Jesus mean by taking his yoke? It means accepting the will of God and obeying it. May this be my joy today. Well, we'll get to the words in a minute. It means accepting the will of God and obey. I don't know sometimes that word obey too in the church hall, maybe I kind of look at it, it's like, oh, he said obey. Well, the Bible talks about obedience. I don't know, obedience can be a good thing, right? Obedience or submission is the, the key to freedom. See, God has a perfect plan for each one of you. And when you obey that plan, we please the Father, we glorify the Son, and we allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, right? Nobody has the same life plan. God has a unique plan for each one of you. <clears throat> God has a perfect way which may be known to all who will obey the way is shown. His worth is truth revealed. It cannot be concealed when to his will revealed he guides us on. Right? May this be my joy today. And maybe that's a good prayer for ourselves. Right? Maybe this be my joy. To hear and to obey my Savior's word. Right? Notice, to read in every line, God's will and make it mine, be this my joy, my wonder. This is the yoke that Jesus wants to give us, a yoke of joy, right? In fact, there are yokes that do not bring joy, right? Think of the yoke of sin, right? For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. This was David, after he had sinned with Bathsheba, refused to get right with him, and it took a toll on him both emotionally and physically. He was carrying the burden of sin, right? This pastor I said, keep short accounts, that's the thing to do. But David didn't at the time, and he paid the price for that. You know, you mess up, get right with the Lord. That's the best thing to do. That doesn't bring joy. Neither does the yoke of religion. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. This speaks of the, the Pharisees and the religious people today were basically telling all these people, you need to do this, this, and that, and really putting a burden on them they couldn't even bear, or they weren't willing to bear themselves. That is the yoke of religion. There's no joy there. And that's not the grace teaching that you see in the scriptures. Is it right? I might add there's the yoke of legalism. I remember hearing a testimony from a believer quite a ways back. He got saved out of the extreme legalistic teaching. And legalism really is the idea that I, just by doing and acting a certain way, then I will be spiritual and pleasing to God, right? Well, he got saved out of a, an extreme legalistic teaching. You had to wear your hair a certain way. You had to dress a certain way. You had your behavior had to be a certain way. There was all this focus on the external. It basically came down to sin management. And he said he felt defeated all the time. Because he could never measure up. 
And when he got saved all that, he says, that was such a relief. I experienced freedom for the first time in my life. But he was under the bondage of legalism. I might add to it the, le- the, the, the bondage of guiltism, right? That's just as defeating and not very encouraging, right? A life of guilt. The motivation for the Christian life should not be guilt or legalism or religion. Right? It should be the love of Christ that compels us. And the contrary to all these, these are yokes that don't bring joy. Jesus Christ's yoke is easy. The yoke of Christ is easy and the burden is right. And Christ bears the yoke with us. And that goes back to the two oxen thing, because I didn't realize that until like today. There's two oxen there. Well, why? Well, because they can both share the burden. Okay. So Jesus Christ wants to share our burden with him, being yoked together with Jesus Christ. Oh, that, that, that's pretty cool. Jesus said in verse 30, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word easy really carries the idea of well-fitting. Right? He has just the yoke that is tailor-made for your life. And also the burden of doing his will, it's not a heavy one. That's really the essence, uh, part of the essence of that song, Be This My Joy Too. You know, when you're doing the will of God and, and you're enjoying it, it, it's a joy. Right? It's not a burden. I mean, what, what, what more could we want? You know, one thing we, we talk about a lot is how the Christian um, life is about a relationship, right? A relationship with Jesus Christ. And I just want to share this with you. We came up with this. For the, we did a whole series on the Christian life, too. We tried to simplify it a little bit. But the Christian life is being aware of and enjoying your relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and, you're, and people probably know that, right? Being aware of, because you've got to be aware of it, right? but enjoying your relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wants to enjoy the relationship with you, but the enjoying part usually is back on us, right? But there can be joy in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I just want to share this little verses with you that me and my wife have enjoyed for some time, and I'm sure many of you have. This is Paul was praying for, it's a prayer in the book of Ephesians, and Paul was praying for the church there. He said, for this reason I bow my knees, right? He's praying, to the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Sounds like a good thing. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Right? Have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What a great prayer. And I get out of... He's praying that you just get to know Jesus Christ better. Learn about him. Understand him. He's the one, and, I, I think the, and I'm still growing in that area. I've been saved like 30 years. And I think, sometimes I think I'm just a babe in trying to understand this relationship thing. But as we learn more about our Savior, why wouldn't we want to be yoked to him when we believe what he can do for us? So, thought I'd share that with you anyways. Right? But we also see in verse 29 the word learn. If we want to grow in grace and become more like the master, we must grow in our knowledge of the master. <clears throat> Second Peter 3 says, 3.18 says, uh, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we are to grow in the grace and the knowledge. And knowledge we can get by reading. I mean, that could be purely academic, too. I mean, the unsaved can read. But there's a lot of stuff written about Jesus Christ in the Bible. You know, there's a lot of good commentaries out there. There's books out there. There's, you know, there's a lot of ways to increase your knowledge about Jesus Christ. It just takes time. And probably there's a facet of experiential knowledge as, as Christ works things out in your life and you know, helps you with your problems and things like that. We learn to trust the Lord more. We come to him by faith, and he becomes our Savior. We take his yoke, and he becomes our master. And now we learn from him, and he becomes our teacher and our example. And the last thing he says here is is to find rest. When you come to Christ in faith, he gives you rest. Notice, when you come to Christ in faith, though, and that's really what can get kind of tough, because we've got to trust the Lord, right, when it comes to a, a trial. When we come to Christ in faith... He gives you rest. And I know what? We all want rest. Isn't, there, don't, isn't rest wonderful? I mean, where would we be without rest? This is a spiritual rest. But I know sometimes you wake up in the morning. Like one of, Some of my favorite mornings are, like, are Saturday and Sunday because I don't have to get up at the crack of dawn like I do for work. And you can even just lay there and you can just rest a little bit. It's like, this is nice. 
And certainly we want a spiritual rest because life can be stressful. There's a lot of things we've got to deal with. And there is a faith rest life that's there. And Jesus Christ wants to give us rest. So when we take his yoke and we learn about him, he helps us find the rest that we so dearly want. In fact, you know what? It is the rest or the peace. Same thing. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. That's got to be pretty good rest because it surpasses all understanding. I don't even really know what that means. I, I mean, I know what that means, but I don't like totally know what that means. Right? How can something pass all understanding? Well, apparently it can. So. Now, Jesus Christ in the upper room, he was getting ready to leave, depart. He knows what's ahead. His death, imminent death. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled nor the letter be afraid. So he's getting ready to leave. He's saying, you know what? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He's trying to encourage them. And you know, he knows things ain't going to go so well the next 24 hours. In fact, in Jesus' day, you know, the Roman world was, was they were brutal. Boy, Jesus Christ was just so, so opposite. He was just so gentle and humble in spirit. Here's a verse I've really come to like. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will say, He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. That's kind of cool. The ESV says He will exalt over with loud singing. This is a picture of our Heavenly Father holding His frightened children, child on His lap and singing to Him. Like so many, a parent is done with a child. I, I think of my daughter. You know, I got, again, little grandsons. And boys are new to me, right? I raise girls. Boys, they're falling, cutting this and that. So there's a lot of crying going on. But where do they go? They go to their mama, right? And they want to be held in her arms, and she brings them comfort. And so I think that's the picture you can get to. We have a father that says, you know, when you're hurting, I want to help you all. I'll sing you back to hell. So I really like that picture there. Now, we know that the Lord sang here while he was on earth, right? Before they, before they left the upper room, they sang a hymn. Right? We know that the Holy Spirit hopefully sings through us when we're singing in worship. And here the prophet also tells us the Father sings, right? I don't know exactly what that means. You can ask, like, Tom later. But it says here that he rejoices over us with singing. You know, we can't control the weather. Some terrible weather going off this country right now. We can't control the circumstances around us. We can't, you know, control the disturbing news that we see on the TV. You know. We can't even always manage how we feel. But we can be, we can control how we handle all of it. Really, I guess it should be our response. Right. As children of the Heavenly Father, we have an invitation. Right. Invitation to experience peace in the midst of distress, disappointment, and anxiety. That's our paradox. We are yoked that we might be freed. And the truth behind the statement, Jesus said, come, take my yoke, learn from me, and find rest. So where in the, the yoke that Christ gives you enables you to find rest and freedom in your heart, he says, come to me, and I will give you. And that's, uh, that's all I got. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just again come before me and thank you for this opportunity to open your word. And may we just all be able to meditate on, especially the last few verses here, on, on the yoke of Christ and how there's an invitation. One for salvation, I would pray if there's anyone here that's not saved, Father, they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and find that rest and have the, the, the blessed assurance of eternal life. And for we as believers, that we would, we would come to Jesus Christ, take his yoke and learn from him so that we could find the rest. The rest we so dearly desire, the rest that is available to us and oftentimes eludes us. And so pray that we may just grow in our relationship and our knowledge with Jesus Christ and that we be willing to take his yoke and let him be our teacher. So, so again, thank you for everyone that came tonight and just uh, uh, thank you that we could open up your word and learn more about you and your son and all that you've done for us. So we just pray now in Jesus' name, amen.